We're here today, this is a, 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 a short seminar that's been organised uh, by the CLA and with our three guests here who are very noisily opening their cans right behind me, um, uh, to talk about um, joining up forces, uh, how to scale, and I've got, I've sort of, how to scale up for environmental action, but also in my mind, so that we can access environmental markets. Because it's sort of, it, 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 it's, a, it's a real quandary if you're not a big operator, how do these markets actually apply to us? Uh, I can see that the markets are available. I hear people talking about them all of the time, but I'm not sure how, in my operation, I, I can access those markets. And I hope that we're going to be able to answer some of those questions today. We've got three guests today, and we're going to start, we're going to go from the sort of the macro picture down to the micro picture. And we're going to start with uh, Helen, who's with us from DEFRA today, and she heads up the green finance team. Um, these markets need organisation, and, and that needs to happen at government level. It's not really going to happen organically uh, from the bottom up. And, and Helen's been tasked with putting, in the the putting the structures in place that's going to make that happen. And in order to do that, she's been tasked with doing the research necessary to see how that will best be affected. I think I've already forgotten which order of events. Uh, she's first, and then Gavin. I first went to, to visit a um, Cranbourne Estate, which uh, Gav Gavin uh, is heavily involved in quite a few years ago, an exceptionally beautiful Dorset estate. I don't think I've ever seen anywhere more beautiful and more beautifully run, actually. It, it's a real testament to excellent land management. Um, he's got a high involvement. He was one of the founders of, of whenever people talk to us about farm clusters or farming clusters or farmer clusters, we're not really sure what we call them. Martin Downs is the one that comes to their minds and the ones uh, uh, which is the one that Gavin was uh, heavily involved in setting up the Martin Downs. Now I think a super cluster, is that right? I think we need to think of new words. We can't just keep getting bigger on that. Uh, William, who's going to speak after him, uh, William had joined the National Parks Partnership in 22 as the Nature-Based Solutions Lead. What we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from, from, from William is how these uh, markets are actually going to work in our, uh, in our protected areas and in our uplands and in designated areas. I have a particular interest in that. I grew up on Dartmoor. My family's still a farm on the edge of the moor and uh, our commoners on the moor and also freeholders of the moor. So, so I'm really interested to hear how this, and therefore very much uh, under the eye of our national park. So I'm really interested to hear how these markets are going to be accessed, for example, by the commoners and the tenants uh, that are on our part of the moor. I think the best thing to do is to kick off with Helen and she's going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to lean down and get my phone or I've put it somewhere near me or I'll look at somebody else's watch. She's going to tell us for about eight minutes what she's at and, uh, and then I'd like um, perhaps to have a couple of questions straight away rather than gather all our questions up for the end uh, so that we clarify our, our, our narrative of what's happening here tonight, this afternoon, as we go along. So Helen, away you go. You don't have to stand up. I just prefer it when I'm doing it myself. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Helen Edmondson, DEFRA, Head of Green Finance. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, just to start off with, it's definitely not just my job to try and bring order to nature markets. Uh, it's definitely a joint endeavor, uh, not just in government, but I would say with most of you sitting out there and definitely up here on the panel as well. Um, you said to start macro, so I thought I might just actually set out a little bit of the story about you know where we are now, about how we got there um, from a government perspective. So back in 2019, government published its first ever green finance strategy. And in that green finance strategy, it's got sort of three headline objectives. So one is around greening finance. And basically what this is, is how do we put climate environment into the decision making of financial and economic actors so that they actually do start integrating the impact of climate the impact of the environment on their bottom line um, and how they better understand risk the second objective was about financing green so how do you get money flowing towards green outcomes and green activities whether that be the low carbon transition whether it's thinking about climate resilience or indeed on the natural environment side and then the third objective was about seizing the opportunity. Um, so it's obviously not just the UK that's thinking about these issues. This is a global phenomenon. All of your big asset managers, financial firms, everyone is thinking about this is the way we need to embrace the fact we need to ultimately 
go on a transition where climate environment is part of how we think about economic growth and how we live. So that was 2019, that strategy came out. I would say since then, if I move on to my sort of second, that was the really macro, we had this big strategy. Second then, so what's happened since then? So I think that strategy really sort of put a flag in the sand. I don't think natural environment was really up front and center in that strategy. Sort of, there were some good hooks in there, but it wasn't really prominent. It was predominantly around that low carbon transition. Since then, uh, what have we had? Well, we've had our CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, so we've set internationally a whole new set of targets about addressing the biodiversity crisis. We've had ICBIS, which is a scientific body equivalent to the IPCC, um, scientific body on biodiversity, which, you know, talked about the biodiversity crisis, and I think what was different is that this was on the front page of mainstream newspapers on the BBC, it was on the New York Times. Um, it's very, very prominent. It's in people's, you know, dinner conversations, and again, you get the financial institutions. I heard even somebody talk to me and say, oh, it's, uh, it's the David Attenborough effect. I mean, maybe this is a very UK-specific thing, but it's really in their psyche, and they've got shareholders saying to them, we want to do something, we want to address plastics, we want to address this biodiversity crisis, so what, what actually can we do? So you've had the CBD, you have, you've had ICBIS. Um, closer to home, in government, we commissioned something called the Das Gupta Review, Importantly, this was coming from Treasury, our finance ministry, to really look at, well, what are the economics of biodiversity? We all know about it, we all care about it, but what's the economic growth angle here? How do we actually start doing that, factoring it into financial and economic decision making? So that report came out. Um, and then I think, uh, in addition to that, getting even sort of bringing it down even further, um, the Broadway Initiative, partnering with the Green Finance Institute and Finance Earth and working with the CLA, thank you very much, um, and probably working with a lot of people around this room as a coalition came together and said, there is a lot of interest out there from financiers, from people who want to purchase uh, environmental benefits, but these nature markets are really nascent. What do we actually need to see from ourselves? So there were farmers, developers, water companies, CLA, you know, we had a whole range of different, I think it was up to 300 different stakeholders. Well done for trying to bring all of those voices together, I would say. Um, and they produced a report called F um, Financing uh, Nature's Recovery, the FNR report. If you haven't read it, please do. And they started to set out a little bit of a framework of, if we really want to see finance flowing into the natural environment, these are the different pillars. This is what, you know, you government need to focus on and what we need to, we need to take forward. So that was all very helpful framing. We also had our Environment Act, just throwing that in there as well. Very proud of the Environment Act. Lots of really good initiatives in there, putting the environment on that legal footing. Um, so green finance strategy sets a stall. Lots of focus on nature in particular. Um, so what next? So March, just a few months ago, we had our second green finance strategy. We also had something called a nature markets framework. And you also had something that the Green Finance Institute um, worked uh, with a whole bunch of stakeholders, bankers, farmers, food companies, supermarkets, on how do we finance a farming transition. So those three documents came out in March and tried to address exactly what you were saying, Victoria, which is what is government's role at trying to provide some certainty around what is very messy, ultimately? I think what we hear terms like the Wild West gets used uh, sometimes about how these markets look like. So what this nature markets framework does is it says, look, these are the state of the markets at the moment. Um, they're very small, they're very nascent. You have a compliance market that's coming out in the form of biodiversity net gain. That was introduced through the Environment Act. It will come live in November. Um, but you also have a whole bunch of voluntary markets as well. Um, and the main ones that we're seeing are the Woodland Carbon Code, Peatland Code. Um, and then there's all sorts of different other codes and standards in development because, you know, people might not want to do the tree or the peat. It might not be what's on their land. They might want to do other things. So there's lots of innovation happening. So we set out state of the markets. We set out our sort of approach as government in terms of how we want to see these markets evolve, views on stacking. We would like to see stacking. We need multifunctional land use. We live on a small island. We need to maximize that value from the land. We need food. We need all these environmental outcomes. But critical among that is we do need to have uh, environmental integrity and additionality within that. So how are we measuring that? And how can we simplify that? And that is actually some of the research that we are wanting to kick off, including how we are exploring these additionality tests to try and simplify 
so that actually, you know, it's much easier to do that stacking so we can move forward. I think the second really important thing that came out of that Nature Markets framework is a partnership we have kicked off with the British Standards Institution, the BSI. So I mentioned all of these standards, they're all very exciting. Um, but what's that filter mechanism? How do we ensure that with these codes, they actually do what they say on the tin? How do we provide certainty um, for both suppliers who are supplying into the market, but also critically the people who are purchasing? How do they really know they've got the carbon? How do they really know they've got that biodiversity? So rules of the game, we've got our standards, but also starting to set up well, what the next steps. We can't answer all of the questions now. These markets are pretty early stage. Um, so there is going to be a review into voluntary markets by the end of the year looking at those voluntary carbon markets in particular, but also on the nature market side, are, are there additional regulations or regulatory needs required or not? Um, also thinking about the accreditation role, who can do that accreditation of these emerging, um, these emerging markets? And then rather excitingly, uh, we did have an event at number 10 last week uh, with our Secretary of State. Uh, some of you may have been in attendance. I can see Archie over there, he was definitely there. Uh, and at that event, we also talked about how we really want to focus on support for developing these projects in the first place, right? It's pretty complex, as we just said. How do you actually create these projects? How do we do that aggregation? And you've got William and Gavin here who can tell you much more about what that looks like from their side. But we do have something called the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund, the NERF. May, you may have heard of that. We have 86 projects across England already. And we announced that we want to do a third round of that NERF, but specifically targeted at farmers and land managers um, to better understand what some of their challenges are and how some of this quite catalytic grant uh, up to 100K can help them unlock and start exploring where those other revenue streams can come from. So we're very excited about that. Please do come and talk to me afterwards. Um, and then the second thing was a farmer toolkit. So from that NERF program that I just mentioned, the Green Finance Institute has developed an investment readiness toolkit. We call it the snake, because it looks like a snake. Um, they are actually at our DEFRA tent today. Um, and the sense was this investment readiness toolkit probably is more targeted towards those project developers. And actually, can we come up with a toolkit which is actually much more targeted to the land manager and the farmer? So what questions do you have? What kind of answers do you need? What is the decision tree that you might need to go through? How can we target it and make it much more useful? Um, almost putting the power back in your hands so that you can engage in these conversations with those project developers or the, with those finances, knowing exactly what it is you need to know to move forward. Um, so please do go to the DEFRA tent and talk to the GFI on those two things. And I think that's probably all I want to say for now. Thank you. And I just am very grateful to hear all of that detail. One of the questions that I get asked or told, not really a question, more of a statement, is when people say, well, what is DEFRA doing? They don't appear to be doing anything. They don't know what they're doing. And um, I think Helen's introduction there shows us that she knows exactly what she's doing. It's just man massively complex to get something like this going. There were a lot of acronyms in there. I'm not really going to be able to remember all of them. Nerf is great. That's an easy one. We used to have something called a Nerf gun when with the children. It involved firing things at each other. So that's an, an easy one to remember. But, but thank you. If, if there are any questions uh, that people have at the moment for Helen that they think won't wait, do, do wave your arms in the air. You have one straight away. A couple. And one of them is Archie, even coming from the glare. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the, um, the talk there. Uh, Dan from the Rivers Trust, uh, been very involved with markets across the country. Um, one question I have is, you, you made a very good point that, you know, land is squeezed. There's a lot of pressure on land in the UK, uh, and we've got to make sure that our approaches are joined up and they're delivering against what the landscape and the catchments needs. Do you see a risk with these emerging markets like BNG, neutral neutrality, or with different timescales, that we end up actually more siloed in our approach and not joined up? And we're, for instance, doing things like this pond's for neutral neutrality, this, you know, and it's not actually integrated and delivering on the, you know, complex catchment needs. Dangers of silos. Do you want to take two questions at once, especially as the other one comes from a, a descendant of the Rivers Trust? Hi, hi thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely uh, endorse what Dan's just said. Um, I think that's a very multifunctional landscape, so something that we're designing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually then having to disaggregate the outcomes in order to enter these different markets. The question I have is more around 
the role of public funding in the green finance movement. Um, how does that fit in? How does the new ELM fit in? Are we at risk of considering them as two very separate things? Um, and do you think we're moving in the right direction? And what else could we do? Thank you. So, two areas. <laughs> Don't know how you're going to I'm actually. I'm glad you started with the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so multifunctional land use, land getting squeezed. I mean, you are going to hear from two panel members who are talking about how they're, you know, trying to do a whole bunch of things. So I'm sure they'll have thoughts on that question as well. I think for me, it comes back to this, um, this point on stacking. So how, you know, we can create an environment in which stacking becomes a bit easier while maintaining that environmental integrity. My other thought as you were talking is obviously we've got our um, LNRS as our local nature recovery strategies, um, which also I think will help start to identify in those different areas actually where are the most environmental be benefits that, you know, t to gain. Um, I don't think it's an easy one though. Uh, and I do think the, the stacking is the, and the research into that and actually learning from people who are doing it on the ground so we can see how we can simplify that's going to be key. Um, I think on the on the public funding and the interaction with Elm, I think what's quite interesting on the public funding side is there's a whole different sort of trajectory of where we think public money can play a role. So at the moment, on the environmental side, it is you know predominantly grant funding, and some of that will still need to be grant funded. Um, I think it comes down to two things. One, so what, what can we do on the catalytic side with grant funding, say through NERF, and actually um, LR, landscape recovery, where we can support folk do better baselining, get a sense of what that aggregation can look like, um, and think about how they might start accessing a market. I think the second thing is, and obviously with our test and trials, we're looking at outcomes, um, which is what the private sector markets are looking for. They're looking at outcomes, where you can align there. But then you've also got, you know, you've got public money through our woodland carbon guarantee, for example, to try and provide a bit of a floor price on woodland carbon codes. And then one of the other things that I didn't mention actually was we also are moving towards um, an impact fund. Uh, so it's a blended finance facility or it's a fund. Um, it's two very established fund managers. It's Federated Hermes and it's Finance Earth. And DEFRA is putting in 30 million of seed capital um, so projects that are wanting to move forward and get capital moving into them, let's face it, it's all still very untested and you're not going to get your Nat West or your Lloyds putting money into that. It's still too risky for them. Um, whereas, you know, this fund can take a bit of that risk because our grant money is providing that risk capital. So there's different ways that public money can play a role depending on the problem at hand. So I think a, a, a lot of that has really been to do with capacity building in, in all its different forms. And I think William just wanted to make a comment. Yeah, thanks. So it's just to this point, really, because I think that's a really well-made one. And I, we're going to talk about nature markets. And with all this stuff fizzing around and potential opportunities and offers, credit values, uh, that might be the tail wagging the dog. And I think that is where we'll have siloed land use and problems if we decide that we use a particular piece of land, not for its optimal use, but for whatever that market is for. So having a land use strategy and some really objective, clear advice about how you might be able to make that land use that's optimal viable rather than decide I'd like a BNG site here, or I'd like a woodland here because I've heard about some credits. Right, so next up on the list, and I've forgotten, I think is Gavin, I, I think so, and it was to do with the number of slides they had. No, no, not favouritism at all. So, Gavin, off you go. Uh, thank you, Victoria, and good afternoon. Everybody, just very quickly, we, we farm in, in Dorset. Um, I'm, I'm a land agent and I look after uh, an, the estate um, in Cranbourne. Um, so and the environmental farmers group uh, grew, uh, really it was a sort of lockdown baby, um, and it grew really from the cluster movement, um, Victoria was right in the introduction, we were quite early into setting up a farmer cluster uh, in our part of the world, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust are just around the corner at Fordingbridge, so there's a real hot spot of clusters already in our part of the world, that picture you can see on that slide is actually Richard Benyon visiting a uh, bit of the bit of the River Raven uh, when we officially launched. Um, <coughs> so why have we set up the Environmental Farmers Group? Well, we 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 felt that markets needed to be aggregated um, across a wider scale uh, as farmers, and we'd been doing it for nature at a cluster level already. Um, and we, the main driver was we'd calculated in the Avon River catchment. 
farmers were going to be losing 37 million pounds worth of B BPS payments uh, uh, in the next two or three years. You know, we're on a we're already on that trajectory uh, of, of of the thin end of that wedge of BPS reduces every year. And where's that income going to come from? And as Helen said, we've got these nascent markets in uh, uh, natural capital, uh, which covers a wide range of uh, uh, of uh, outcomes. Um, and so we felt, wh what are we going to do? We need to, we need to marry up uh, uh, us as providers of potential natural capital um, outcomes with seekers. Uh, and there are lots of people in the market looking for carbon, looking for BNG, which is biodiversity net gain, which comes in compulsorily in November, uh, for um, phosphate mitigation, in particular uh, in the River Avon, um, no houses can be built without a proper phosphate, mit mit phosphate mitigation plan. Uh, nitra nitrates leaching into our chalk and into our water courses. So we set up, uh, we met every week through lockdown on Zoom uh, as a working group. Uh, we were facilitated by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and brilliant work from them. We then created a board um, and we were ready to launch with, with members uh, and they came out of those clustered movements. Um, and we now have a model whereby if you want to be part of the environmental farmers group, uh, you pay one pound twenty-five a hectare, um, and you say that if there is a natural capital opportunity to trade, um, it comes to my door. I ask the EFG to do it for me. To I ask them to do the de do the deal, to do the heads of terms, and to act. The EFG also then has approaches from uh, buyers, from seekers, saying uh, we need to find a, a reed bed for this development. Um, and we can facilitate that deal. We can talk to farmers. Do you want to do it? No. Do you want to do it? I could do. What does it mean for me? So going back to the question uh, about um, different silos for different outcomes, by aggregating a market, we can actually look across our members. Uh, and also means our farmers can farm. They can produce food. But they can also think about, and um, because they're part of a large-scale model, uh, whether they, they don't have to bet the farm to do their bit for natural capital. The model for us is that... So I I if one deal lands, um, you get the capital income from that or the, the annual revenue from that income, but you only get you get 88%. 9% goes to the, the other members. That's your reward for being part of a cooperative. That says thank you for adding scale. Thank you for adding the ability for us to talk to markets, to talk to DEFRA. And, and Helen will remember early on a call we had about stacking. And, and we had a really good debate about whether it's going to work or not. And it's been fantastic because we have that scale to be able to influence, to be able to get listened to, uh, and people coming asking us questions too. So DEFRA have been really great um, to us in, in that uh, uh, early time. Um, so we, we, we consider ourselves to be navigators. Um, nobody has compel nobody's compelled to trade at all. You can do what you like, carry on farming. Uh, you just happen to be mem a member of a co-op. If you decide to sell something or be involved, you can, but you will get income. And we reckon it will cover your mem membership fee at least uh, in every year that you join from other people's trades. Um, I think So the BPS was a big thing, losing that income. We, we do have to think about wh where our income is going to come from. Um, and I think that's pretty much me. There's one more slide here. I'm just going to show you the scale. So the... Um, the middle part of that, y those of you who recognize the south coast of England, that's the Isle of Wight and that's the Solent, and the blue is the sea, obviously. The, uh, the cell in the middle, effectively, is the Avon catchment with the red at the top and red at the bottom. That's the, uh, the river catchment map of the, of the Avon. You can see those blue are members, so they are paid up members. Uh, and now, in the test and itching, um, to the right, around Winchester, uh, there are new members in that cell. Uh, and then to the left, further west, is the River Stour, all around Blandford. Um, and those are our members in that area too. So you'll see we've, we've got converted, fully paid up members uh, and, uh, 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 and expressions of interest. So that's members that are saying, I want to join, I want to join, I, want e I need, that need to find some more information. Um, but, you know, 93,000 hectares, it brings some amazing scale uh, for us, 196 farmers. We've got, uh, I was talking last night in Peterborough, to a group of farmers who may or may not want to be uh, interested in setting up a cell. And so they'll be locally run, locally managed, local boards, owned by farmers, run as a cooperative, and managed by farmers. The whole philosophy for us is trying to keep value in, in natural capital markets at farmer level. We own the land, we manage the land, we should, remain, we, we should retain control of it, and that's our main philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gavin. That's really, that, that, so first we had the big picture, 
and and now we've had um, uh, immediately a way that farmers and land managers can get together to scale up what they want to do and and create packages that are, are can be purchased. So that's about the scaling up, um, and certainly the loss of BPS is going to resonate with everybody who's farming at the moment. Uh, anyway, so, so you know we need to take action about that loss of income. Uh, in the farmers. Is there anybody who's got a question uh, about the environmental farmers group that they'd like to ask now? Thank you. Um, when we had our dry run last week, I said th there'll be definitely the first question will be landlords and tenants. How does that work? <laughs> so if you've, you've won the prize. Um, we get asked it a lot. We really do. I'm a landlord's agent. We have tenants that are members. Um, and, and each landlord and each tenant, it's horses for courses, it depends on your relationship with your tenants. Our view is that landlords need to get around the table with their tenants because uh, the tenants are losing their BPS and landlords shouldn't want be wanting tenants to turn up on their doorstep saying I'm not paying the rent, I can't afford to pay the rent. Uh, there are people looking for a home for their natural capital money, whether that's developers, whether it's uh, 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 DEFRA, or, 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 or those income streams need a relationship conversation between a landlord and tenant. The Agriculture Act, the, the, um, the Agriculture Holdings Act uh, and the Agriculture Tenancies Act, uh, you could say is a restriction because it defines agriculture. Anything coming out of agriculture means that we have to have a conversation. Well, as far as I'm concerned, good relationships mean you sit around a table. Just like any diversification project, a tenant and a landlord have a conversation about who's going to put the money in, who, who's going to share the rewards, whether you rentalise the rewards, what do you think about it? Landlords worry about long-term land use change. And so that's, that, that's an excuse for landlords and tenants to sit down together. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm seeing uh, 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 amongst my contemporaries really positive conversations about the future of land occupation, the future of farming between landlords and tenants. Uh, and it's great to sit around a, 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 a farmhouse table and not talk about a bloody rent review. Actually talk about the future of farming, think about where natural capital is going and actually uh, and not be hamstrung by legislation. I think the, the the landlord and tenant issue is a is a live one as we go through the obviously for the through the next four or five years and and it's something that the CLA and the Tenant Farmers Association work at together. We know that the most positive future is one where there's active collaboration. Nobody benefits at all if if it just descends into a into a struggle. Um, and we're getting lots of really positive, as you said, positive results from those collaborations. What's there, there are some big, just let me finish, there are some big questions that we need the lawyers to answer about ownership, you know, who's added to that natural capital, Who ha whose was the original basis of the natural capital or carbon, who loses it if it starts to go missing, who does that fall on, there is ju these are just big legal questions, it doesn't mean that we have a strong view about them, it just means we need to have some answers before we can start signing uh, you know, really long-term contracts with people. Because once we know those answers, then people can move forward into the contract situation. Can we hold your next question until we've heard from the last, the, the, you know, the last member of the panel? William. Thank you, Victoria. So I guess the first question is, prob is why the national parks probably? Because it's, in my experience from national parks, and that is 14 years of working in private practice land management, um, they haven't been at regenerative agriculture shows, they haven't been at the Royal Show, um, so why, why are we here? But we've got some skin in the game from a National Parks perspective because we want two things predominantly from our landscapes. One is for nature to be prosperous and one is for the farming community to be prosperous because they form our landscapes and look after it and are custodians. I guess the challenge has been that historically they haven't always been natural bedfellows and that's caused some tension sometimes. They're very, very good relationships lots of the time between the farming community and their protected landscape officers, but sometimes there has been some tension. I don't know about your experience of that, Victoria, and Dartmoor. Mixed. Yeah. Cla <laughs> and that's the story. But what's been interesting is as natural capital markets have emerged, and I think part of the context is the language we use, peop natural capital markets, nature finance, private finance, green finance, nature markets, ecosystem services, it becomes white noise to farmers, and I think it's uh, and, uh, and my family are farmers, so I I know <laughs> I know this, um, and it's confusing. And I think that there's been a there's been a desire for some objective advice around subjects, which I I think farmer-led cluster groups are are providing. 
But the farming community has increasingly been coming to the National Park Authority office and ask, officers and asking for some support and some guidance. And so the National Park looked at this and thought, well, there, there might be something here. This is, a, this is a new alignment that we haven't seen before. And also, we do want to stand in front of our land management and farming community here where they feel, and actually probably are, um, exposed. The other thing about National Parks is, same with um, cluster groups and con any conveners, we have some key attributes that actually are really fundamental to making these things work and work at scale and aggregation. So sca scale is one, some ecological expertise and some experience in partnership working because you, you do need to be able to work in partnership to get these things operating, um, not just on your own holding with your own advisor. So that was great, except the National Park doesn't really know a huge amount about natural capital, or at least it didn't. So we started, um, we, we now have a partnership, some of you may have heard of Revere, and that partnership is between the National Parks, UK, and Palladium, and some of those guys are here right now, so stick your hand up if you want. Um, and with their expertise in, in natural capital markets, nature-based solutions, and raising private finance, we've been able to look at how we might provide some of the solutions that to the problems, to the barriers there are in getting these things off the ground at scale and making them work for farmers. So Revere, the partnership, went out and did a load of feasibility studies. We worked with farmers in their landscapes, testing these things out uh, at a desktop level, basically, getting baselines from their land, understanding what the opportunity was, and overlaying that with the current value of ecosystem services, the credits that you generate if you undertake these projects, uh, and the cost of the project, and the, and the margins that farmers would need to make this viable at a farm scale. And we found out there were some pretty serious barriers to that. Um, and those principally were, there's really very few markets. I think people don't say that enough. That it, it, it sound, If you were, depending on what day you read what article or went on what website, you might think you're missing something. But really, there's woodland carbon, peatland carbon, BNG if you're in a, which are habitat and landscape specific, BNG if you're in the right place, nutrient neutrality if you're in the right place. So there isn't an opportunity for every farmer and every holding to engage in these markets. That's an issue. The value of the credits often, almost always, isn't high enough to for those projects to be viable and shift the dial for land managers. So they can't, it's difficult to engage these markets if, you, if you're going to give up more income than you might gain. Small farmers are excluded, and that's another problem. Having been an estate manager until quite recently, those estates can pay for, pay for advice. If you embark on these projects, you generate quite a lot of credits. That makes them easier to sell. You have more selling power. You've got a, probably a stronger balance sheet with your assets, so you can hedge a bit more. Um, and brokering fees are disproportionately high. So you, on a small scale, you might embark on one of these projects on your farm. Lots of agents cost. Um, you go through the validation process. You get a few credits, and you go and sell them, and actually there's not a lot left for you, and that's, that's an issue. Uh, and a massive anxiety around who you should sell these credits to. And we will getting pretty familiar now with the concept of greenwashing. And it's quite a technical and sophisticated thing to have to do to work out whether or not your buyer is, is credible, whether or not they are reducing all of their emissions that are avoidable, or whether or not in their hierarchy and displacing nature, whether they are actually trying to mitigate and reduce those. So the conclusion of all this was that it's not really a panacea, and I think that's the other thing which is important to note. I think natural capital markets, they are going to have a role in an integrated land management system and they're going to provide some diversified income for farmers, but they're not, they're not the silver bullet, I think. Um, and po possibly nor should they be, because that might drive some perverse outcomes as well for the landscape. So we've, we've learned all this stuff, um, but we found out more about what you can't do than what you can do. So we're like, right, what are we going to do, do about this? Um, and enter the Yorkshire Dales. And the Yorkshire Dales is a landscape which we, the nation loves. It's iconic. Um, we all recognize it. It's steeped in cultural heritage, particularly around farming and sheep farming. Um, but there's something a bit weird going on the Yorkshire Dales, which is that there are no trees, really. There's 4% tree cover. Um, and for context, the UK average, including built-up areas, is 13%. So one of the Yorkshire Dales core nature recovery objectives is to increase tree cover. And that causes some concern in itself, because understandably, given what the farming community wants to hear about rewilding and the NGOs and what everybody wants to do, um, is the plan to completely change that landscape and no more farming or significant reduction in farm? It's not. It's to get to 6%, which is like 1,500 more hectares woodland in 70,000, I think. So it's, it's just moving the dial a little bit. Um, but the problem still remains. We've got all these barriers that I'd mentioned earlier. 
and we canvass farmers uh, in the Yorkshire Dales and say, like, hey guys, there really aren't very many trees. Why aren't there many trees? Or what what are the barriers? Do you do you not want to plant trees? And they said, no, we we would definitely plant trees um, on parts of our farm where it made sense, and there are parts of our farm where this makes sense. We know they're unproductive or they're marginal, but it's not viable. We might be able to get a grant. There's a bit of maintenance. If we cut corners, we might make a bit of income, or if we're efficient, we might make a bit of income, and then it runs out. So that doesn't really work for us. Um, it's the same old story a bit. Uh, the question is for the national parks is how can we, how can we make this work then? Um, th what the farmers said that they wanted was certainty of income. And that's quite hard to get in carbon credit markets or nature markets. Um, they wanted consistent payments, area-based payments, which they knew they would get every year, and ideally at or close to outgoing BPS rates, which is understandable. Um, so Palladium did a lot of modeling. I'm going to make this sound quite simple, but it's not. A lot of modeling to work out if you could pull together aggregations, so we get some selling power, across smaller sites, so which work for farmers, 5 to 20 or more hectares, an average of 20 sites to get to our 1,500 hectares, so around 70 sites. But that's the kind of scale that actually works for farmers because they don't want to be foresters, they want to be farmers with some woodland on their holding. What would the value of carbon credits have to be? And um, we found out it would probably have to be double or more what it is right now in the market, so like around 70 or 80 pounds. And that's pretty tough because if you go and try and say to a buyer, we want, uh, we'll have 70 pounds for our carbon credits, pounds, they'll say, I wouldn't have thought so. We can get them for 30 or 35. Um, so that's problematic, but that's what we found out. And if we could get to that sum, we could pay farmers um, or can pay farmers a sum close to the base rate consistently every year, uh, BPS, sorry, every year per hectare and link that to inflation. And if we could, if we can do that, farmers said we would we'll sign up. And I think that makes, that makes sense to me because you, you, you're giving a clear offer and that seems to be what's lacking in the market. So it is big, I say with 1,500 hectares, 70 odd sites, um, but can we get 70 or 80 pounds a hectare? Well, um, I think actually, we, uh, 70 or 80 pounds of credit, sorry, I think actually we probably can. And the reason we can is because we've created that scale, so we're leveraging some selling power. Uh, the buyers are really interested in the social impact of some of these projects, and that includes making sure that the farming community, the, fa the social fabric of those areas is maintained. And it's not if we get corporate buyers buying land and planting a lot of trees. Um, so there's a real chance that we that we actually can do this to get to the point where we can mobilise um, farmers to create more woodland, and it works for them in their farming mix. I say as a as a part of their farm rather than becoming um, everything they do. There's another s slide which gives a bit um, of information about the mechanics, and it's actually this is the masterpiece of Tom Gek, who's sat there in a white T-shirt. So if anyone's got some really difficult questions, I'll probably pass them to Tom. Have you got the next slide? Thanks, mate. Um, so this isn't immediately obvious, but this is effectively how it works. So there will, it is likely, and this is, you, you hear about private capital and private investment a lot. So, so why would we need that? Well, we need that because there's a, a difference between the grants available for creating woodland and the cost of uh, implementing this project. So planting, designing, planting the trees, contracting with farmers, validating on the woodland con code, and making the early base payments to farmers so that they can transition. Because the cash flow is an issue. You can't just, you, I mean, you guys in the audience know more than I do, just tra plant a woodland and then hope for the best and wait to whenever you might sell your carbon credits. You need that cash flow to keep coming in. So there's a, there's a finance gap there, and that's where we need private capital and we need investment. Palladium and the Yorkshire Dales are the project developers. Gavin um, talked about project developers. So we're the project developers. And we lift it. Uh, if the farmers want us to, if they don't, that's fine. They, could, they can do it themselves. But we lift off the design of the woodland, managing the contractors, managing the contracts, obtaining the grants, doing all of the work under the Woodland Carbon Code to get these credits validated. And they are validated under uh, talking about nature markets. I think the Woodland Carbon Code, people say things like the Wild West quite a lot. And I, and I, and I take that. Anyone who's been through um, a validation process under the Woodland Carbon Code knows that it is it's seriously rigorous, right? So like this stuff is real and it's conservative. So the supply side is not the Wild West. The buy side might be the Wild West if you're not selling to an organization who is reducing their emissions. So that's why I think it's Wild West. I think there's, with different articles you read and things that are going around the world with different standards, there's a perception that these credit credits aren't real or they're not, they're not credible, they're not integrity. The Wooden Karma Code definitely has. And then we will 
broker those to an organization, a corporate, an institution that is, um, has got a net zero target. And to stand in front of our farmers, we've developed something grandly called the Ethics Charter. And so those organizations have to meet the criteria of that, one of which is that you need to have a net zero strategy, which is independently audited by an organization like the Science Based Targets Initiative, which makes sure that you are on a pathway to net zero, which is credible and science, um, science backed. So that income then project it flows back into the project developers. We pay back the investor because you've got to pay back the investor. Um, there is then a profit share for the Yorkshire Dales, generate some in unrestricted income out of this. Palladium is a project developer for their effort. There's a profit share to Palladium. And if the credits are sold for more than we had expected, we won't embark upon the project unless we get to the minimum viable price to pay farmers the, the base payment. But, but beyond that, um, there will then be another profit share to farmers. So they're not excluded from any upside if the carbon credit market continues to rise. So it's that simple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you were ever wondering why it is that it's quite difficult to, to engage in these markets, I think we've just had a, a, a masterclass in the fact it's, it's not simple, but it can be done. And, and I think there have been some really key th moments in this. I think all of the people who've spoken have talked about the integrity of what we're actually doing here. There is a purpose to trying to lock up, to sequester more carbon. There is a purpose to try and uh, you know, protect our biodiversity. And maybe that should be foremost in our minds w when we embark on this. We don't want the markets to drive the process. We want the process to drive the markets. And to a certain extent, that means that we have to always feel quite responsible, which is what came up with you having an accreditation system for the people who are buying the credits for you to know where those, uh, where those credits are, are being sold. I think that it's, you're, you're completely right that additionality is, is at the core of this. It's going to be easier with trees because they're going to be planted in a separate place. You're not trying to claim two lots of money for, for, for the same action, which, which is what is to be avoided. I think that's a, a, at all costs. So with that straightforward ex explanation of, of the government perspective uh, and, and then the farmer cluster, um, or, or the, the um, not farm cluster, sorry, I got the name wrong again, the <laughs> environmental farmers group, and we've got the most recent one uh, in Palladium and the, um, and the Yorkshire Dales. What seems to me to be immediately clear is that we need good ways of finding these interlocutors that we trust and we can work with so we can bring small land parcels into these families and, and know that we're going to get a, a sound result. It might not be the most glittering and brilliant result that you are hoping for, but probably our advice would always be this is not going to be the answer if you're already over leveraged uh, as, as a business. This is not going to solve all of the problems and we need to move forward quite carefully and quite slowly to make sure we're making sound long-term business decisions. What questions have we got now uh, from the audience? Um, there's a, a, a little, that would be another one from Archie. So we'll go to the person in front of Archie first. Hi, thank you. Matt from RAP. Um, so first, really interesting conversation and sort of reaching out a hand from RAP here would be really interested to get in touch and see how within our, we, we try and convene across the supply chain. And so really interesting to see how that can, we can support that. And following on from that, where does insetting fit within these, you know, with, within the carbon markets? It's a lot about offsetting and selling your gains to potentially outside buyers. Where does insetting sit, it, sit within this and how does that fit in? And the question of insetting comes up a lot. I know a lot of the businesses who've done very, farm businesses or land businesses who've done very thorough uh, audits already have felt that until they've got an absolutely solid handle on their own need for, for, for the future, they shouldn't be looking at selling any, any of those credits. William, would you like to take that uh, insetting question? Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the major problems is we don't know what the need is because the supply chains haven't been clear about what it is that they actually are going to expect of farmers in regard to insetting. So that's a massive problem. Um, but I think, but I'm, you're right. So what I hadn't mentioned in that is, uh, and it seems like I'm retrofitting it now, but I promise I'm not, um, <laughs> is that we will, when we work with the farmers to do this project, we will work with them to do a carbon audit of their operations to make sure that we are holding back a number of credits which will enable them to 
get to next over. The problem is we don't really know exactly. We have to be conservative because we don't really know what the supply chains are asking, if anything, because we get very mixed messages from supermarkets about what it is they actually want. Gavin. Um, yeah, I mean, w just at a, at a um, uh, you were in danger of calling me micro earlier on as well. I was looking forward to you saying micro. Um, <laughs> But but at the cluster level, uh, at a sort of smaller level, we're really clear. We've spent a lot of time researching all of the sort of carbon brokers and the carbon players. Uh, we spent the last two years running. We ran a spreadsheet uh, and an analysis of all, all of them and what they're offering. Uh, we have a soil scientist um, on our advisory board, uh, Professor Mark Kibblewhite, who gave a fantastic presentation to our first members meeting, showing how slow carbon soil stocks move. And and there was a moment I could see about multiple pennies drop in the room, uh, where people thinking, okay, so it's not let's do regen and ca soil carbon just goes up tomorrow. Um, it takes a very long time. So we're saying to our members as an organisation, uh, as a co-op, we don't feel we're ready to trade carbon, and we don't think we should till we understand our own carbon footprint, to understand our own scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, uh, so we start taking other people's scope three emissions effectively. That's we're really clear about that um, because we don't want to be accused of greenwashing. We don't want to be accused of uh, the, the the integrity point. Um, uh, and also, we're we're, we're aggregators. We're, we're not we're not acting officially on their behalf. You know, any actual deal is done between the buyer and the seller. We've just brought them together. But we think it's really important to say, hold fire. Helen, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, what do I have to add to that? I mean, I, I think the key thing is you can either have the carbon or the money. I mean, it's a market, isn't it? So if you've sold the right to the carbon, you have sold the right to the carbon. Um, so, you know, you talked about the integrity of the Woodland Carbon Co. before, you know, there's a whole database that shows where the credits are and who owns them. Um, because otherwise you're going to get double counting in the, in the carbon system. So, you know, each landowner, land manager, farmer needs to think about their land as a, you know, as you do anyway as a business. So what ultimately do you want to do with that land? Do you want to sell that carbon? Do you want to think about the relationship with the supermarket and pitch your product in a different way? I mean, there's so much heterogeneity in terms of what, you know, folk want to do with their land. It, I do think the baselining is the, is the key thing. Um, yeah, start at, start at the very beginning. I imagine, but because this is groundswell, everybody who's a, an active land manager in the room has already sat around their winter dark tables and made sure that they've got a, a very sound carbon audit uh, with them, uh, or, and some like me with a slightly guilty conscience that we've certainly intended to do that and then maybe done something else instead. Um, I, I think that it, it, there's I can see the next question coming up if you'd like to just go back one up there. I think this question of knowing what carbon goes with what pieces of land, I think is going to grow in complexity. What is the value of your base asset once you've denuded it of the value of the carbon that's been sequestered in it? There are such big questions about valuations in that and, and where that's going to sit. Is this all going to sit at the land registry? It's worrying me, because they're not doing fantastically well with keeping up with the, the, the business we're sending them already. So. That when I'm listening to all of you talking, these are the other questions that are in my mind. Next question, please. Um, hi, this is more probably aimed a bit more at Helen than anyone else. Um, there's about 150 million ash trees are going to die in the next 10 years. 20% of all of our tree cover is going to go in the next 20 years. Then the associated carbon will disappear with it. What's DEFRA doing about that? Not quite. Is that in your area? She, do you know, before this, uh, she said, what's going to happen if I get asked a question that's completely outside my area? But maybe you might have heard any. What would you be your best guess? It's about the carbon. Yes, it's about the carbon. How are you going to deal with the carbon? And that's what you've been discussing. Carbon, yes, carbon loss. There's a huge carbon loss in the, in the death of the ash trees. There's, there's, there's an awful lot of embedded carbon in, in, in uh, use up, use up in building projects, which we're also not accounting for at the moment. So that's really about that clear accounting for everything, isn't it? Are we going to account for the ash tree loss? I'd need to double check with my colleague that owns obviously our GHG accounting um, and we obviously have you know what they refer to as Lulu CF emissions, land use and land use change emissions and how they're factoring those in. 
just as a, I guess as a related point, when I think about some of the challenges that gets raised on things like the Woodland Carbon Code and concerns about, you know, well, what happens to those trees if there's a fire, if there's a pest, um, and then, you know, the integrity of the carbon sequestered and what you've sold. I mean, I think as you were saying, William, things like the Woodland Carbon Code are very conservative and they have, I think it's a 20% buffer. So to be able to sequester that carbon, you do need to do 20% more. And that's across, the Wooden Carbon Code is a UK thing, it's across the UK. So for things like those events where you lose, actually nationally, we're still saying we've managed to sequester the carbon that we need to sequester. You've got that sort of inbuilt almost insurance mechanism within that Wooden Carbon Code. There's, there's, quite, there's quite a complicated um, algorithm about the age of the tree when it's actually sequestering carbon, when it's not sequestering carbon. So it depends on the age of the tree, uh, uh, its life, life cycle, and, and at the moment I think it's pole stage trees that are particularly affected. Um, that's the limit of my a ash dieback knowledge. But I think it's not as simple as we're going to lose loads of carbon sequestration from mature ash trees, because I think they're already part of the national inventory. They've done their work already. Um, that's a question for a, for a detailed uh, expert, but that's my understanding. I suppose it makes a difference what you do with it. Uh, are, you, are you going to chip it and put it into the I into the biomass, uh, which is one very one way that can use it? It's not really suitable for an awful lot of um, building. The best way to actually hold the carbon that comes out of um, commercial trees that are felled is to make put them into buildings where you've locked up the carbon for another two hundred years. But we are. It, I think we're going to lose one hundred percent of our ash trees in the next five years at home. It's not going to be a small percentage. It's going to be every single one, and it's an accelerating. It's an accelerating problem. There's another question just here from um, further forward. Um, oh, oh there, you've got, got something right here. there, have you? Yeah. Got one right there. Yeah. <laughs> We've got time for another. Article. Okay, yeah. I can't see very much from here, so apologies. Can the panel um, explain to us what kind of structures they would see in terms of landscape recovery projects, in terms of where private investors could invest in such structures? I hear from the environment group that they've backed away from that, completely understand, but it would be really interesting to hear what sort of thought processes you've, you've all thought through with those emerging ideas. Gavin's going to go first. Well, well actually, uh, we, we, um, we were very lucky to have a, a NERF grant last year which helped us start to put together a catchment-wide conservation plan. So, so we want to understand where our conservation priorities are uh, in the catchment. So it's not just about uh, where can we catching the chi the till from people buying natural capital. But what actually are the conservation outcomes we're looking for, uh, and, and then also then what is tradable after that. And I th we are currently uh, involved in a landscape recovery bid uh, to take that to the next stage and a much wider conservation plan and the in interaction of that. So yeah, we're, we are. We're not disregarding that at all. No, no, sorry, but in terms of the ownership structure, it's good. It people seem so far seem to be doing the on the ground bit. That's the easy bit. What you would like from nature, but the bit that is everyone seems to be struggling with is actually how do you create a governance structure uh, that is actually investable. Well, our, our, our view, I think I've already said, I is that we don't want to be the body that's the recipient of the funds. We, we see we're a matchmaker, we're a sort of a Tinder for nat, nat cap, you know, swipe left or swipe right. Uh, and we're there to matchmake people who want to get involved. What we're hoping to do is put the framework together, but from a governance point of view, the land ownership structure is likely to come with conservation covenants or Section 106 agreements. They are attached to land and attached to ownership. So we, we see that as the, the current way forward. It's understood by lawyers, understood by local authorities as a structure. Helen. So I'm not sure I've got much to add to that, to be honest. I mean, I guess where we're sitting, we're seeing lots of different things pop up so on a sort of formal status so you know kicks community investment companies and again that behind that since so a lot of legal agreements about revenue sharing agreements who gets what where where does that ownership sit so actually the nerf um program that i mentioned before there were four pilots um ahead of that that triados bank um helped support uh, uh one in the river Y has recently uh, got funding and that's a kick model lots of different entities I think it took two, year <laughs> two years just to show you how easy it is to pull all, to all of that together. Um, you're going to have more informal groupings at a cluster level. Um, you've got national parks. So I think there's quite a few different mechanisms. Um, I guess from a government perspective, uh, you know, 
cr crack on um, and, and want to learn, I guess, from what's happening. And if we can support with that catalytic grant funding that I mentioned before to get over some of these transition humps, especially the legal agreements, other sort of standard templates, actually, that we can support so it doesn't have to take two years the next time. William, some, some words on that one. So I think... I, get, I think it's going to be whatever fits the, the members or the land managers. I, in our case, um, the message from farmers was we don't necessarily want to be exposed to the risk of all of this. We like the idea of income certainty, so they won't have a um, they won't have a part of the they won't be part of the legal entity, but the legal entity will contract with them for the terms of on which that they're entering the project. But I think there's another thing here because we you're asking about um, what other vehicles, how they're going to be constituted and to to crowd in private investment but the bigger problem i think is and this is like why you're doing nerf and landscape recovery is right there's not really anything to invest in <laughs> like the investment proposition is not really there yet the markets are really limited and so they don't necessarily um create enough of a return um and also there are some quite generous government grants for a lot of the projects that that do have codes and returns so there isn't a massive space for that private investment so i i think that's why these um nerf funded projects are really really important perhaps not the, the answer everybody wants to hear that the market, but it's true that, the, 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 as you said right at the beginning, these markets are nascent and we don't really know how big they're going to grow. Did you say we had time for one more question? Yeah, one then? quick question, yeah. One quick question, here at the front. Sorry, Archie, ask me later. <laughs> Hi, so it's Kat Moncrief from the South East Rivers Trust. Um, we're I should have realised this was a little Living cabal Rivers Trust. of Rivers <laughs> Trust down here. Um, so we're involved in, a, in one of the NERF projects. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things uh, I think we're beginning to struggle with is that the offer, if you like, from DEFRA through Landscape Recovery in Elms is unclear. And so it's not clear what the sort of, what the offer is or what we can kind of sell to potential businesses because we don't know what the role of the DEFRA funding is. And so I just wondered whether in your examples that you talked about, whether you'd come across that issue, that difficulty in the unknown of the DEFRA Elms funding in that potentially holding back any private investment. I think given the shortness of time, we can, we can, we can set that question in a, how, how, much of a, how much of a challenge do you think this is uh, to pushing projects? forwards, do you feel that you're working I in the dark or do you feel that there's enough clarity to keep moving forwards? Yeah. William. Oh no, William first because you went first last uh, time. <laughs> I think in the dark probably there isn't much clarity. A bit stacking is a bit of a, it's an overused term, but there isn't a lot of clarity how some of these, uh, one of your problems might be what's the market anyway? Um, and then if there are markets, how do they interact with public subsidy? For some of those things, for the projects that we're doing, it's quite clear because you can have a woodland grant, an element of grant, and you can satisfy, provide you satisfy the additional test of the carbon code, you're blending those two sources of funding and finance. But um, more widely, I think it's, it's not really understood, definitely. Well, I think we were at a, a uh, farming festival that has curiosity, uh, has early mover thoughts, and it has, um, what are we going to do about X or Y at its core? And I think uh, as long as everyone has that spirit of curiosity, there is in our mind, early mover advantage to at least get yourself match fit to start thinking about uh, these questions rather than waiting for government to tell you what you should be doing. And I think government and DEFRA actually, are in the for the first time in my professional career, are also saying let's work together and work out what's going to work best rather than being uh, uh, prescriptive. I think it's a, it's a journey everyone's going on in terms of policy, in terms of market development, in terms of pr producing codes. There is an advantage, and you are all converts because you're, I think you're already here at a, an exciting movement about where uh, 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 farming and, and our environment might work together. So, so it's preaching to the converted. So we've got to be match fit, and, and I think it's an opportunity uh, rather than a problem. And all we really want to hear from Helen is, you're on it. 100%. 100%, and we've hit 5 o'clock, and we know we hit 5 o'clock because William started looking at his messages. So... <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.